Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Ruth Fogg. Ruth, welcome. Thank you, Amy. It's a joy to be here. Well, it really is. We have been working together for several months now. We formed a mastermind in within the PSA with a few of us last November, and we have been meeting month on month since then. And finally, we've got down to sit together and record this episode. So I'm really looking forward to delving into your why. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm going to ask you, the first question is, oh, what is it you're doing at the moment, Ruth? At the moment, um, in terms of my occupation, I'm a stress consultant. So I help people overcome whatever is holding them back in their lives and causing them stress. And that's with all ages. The youngest I've worked with is four and the oldest has been 84. So there's a wide range, not quite cradle to grave, but within that remit. Um, I'm also an author, and during lockdown, I've written, I wrote two books, one prior to lockdown, and I've just written another one on um, teenage stress, because they're really struggling at the moment with the end of lockdown, with friendships, going back to school, learning at school, exams, pressure, all the stuff that they have to struggle with. So why stress? Where does that come from? Well, it goes back to 1999 when um, out of the blue, uh, my father dropped dead very unexpectedly. And it was one of those strange things in life. My niece was born in the afternoon and my dad died in the evening. So it was very much one in, one out. And because I'm an only child, obviously that was stressful anyway. And my mum just basically fell apart. So I dealt with all the arrangements and then she decided that she wanted and needed to come and live with me, my husband and our family, my two sons. So we had to sell her house and our house and that was stressful to buy another house which was also stressful finding one that was big enough to have an annex for her as well and then in the meantime my son got his 11 plus and went to high school and within a couple of months he was in hospital with an irritable hip then glandular fever one thing after another and he was diagnosed with ME So to add to that, my mum had a stroke, which triggered the onset of dementia. So I was at the time the head of the youth service in a London borough, the London Borough of Ealing, and I had 150 staff to manage and it just didn't balance. The travelling at lunchtime, rushing home to get my mum and my son fed and watered and when Alistair was 14, I was carrying him to the toilet because he was so weak. So it wasn't just a question of you know, um, a mild case. It was pretty bad and it actually lasted five years. So something had to go. So fortunately, I'd got enough years in with teaching and my youth work or local authority to take early retirement. So that's what I did. And because I'd done a master's degree and a diploma in counselling, counselling psychology, I built on that to build my stress business. So I did training in coaching, hypnotherapy, Reiki, emotional freedom technique, stress management, so that I could build on my portfolio. Wow. Yeah, I mean, when I said, how did that start? That was a pretty, pretty big answer. And 1999 was a particular moment for you where there was a big shift change and everything then started to to change within the family dynamic. 
Was that the first time that you experienced stress? Uh, probably not. As you know, um, I'm profoundly deaf in one ear and now severely deaf in the other. So I guess I'm always a bit stressed because I'm always stressing and straining to actually hear what people are saying and trying to follow. And of course, at the moment with masks, it's it's mission impossible. And I'm I'm almost becoming a recluse. I dread going out because of the masks. And I find it incredibly difficult. And when you ask people to repeat themselves, they get exasperated and they get stressed and it becomes a bit of a vicious circle. So I guess I've experienced stress most of my life, but not not to that extent. So with the mask issues, I mean, that's a communication thing. And you mentioned about how people get exasperated in repeating themselves. But it's difficult to to sort of see and to understand that that's a, a disability that you are you've got that you you are, because it's not visible and it's not easy for people to see that that's an issue, and we take so much for granted. We take so much for granted that you are able to understand what it is they need you to do, and if you're not, then they get frustrated with you. How how have you been? I mean, you've dealt with that all your life. How do you deal with that? Well, it depends what it is. If it's somebody behind a mask, I will actually say, look, I'm really sorry, but I do have hearing issues and I don't understand what you're saying. And a genuine sensitive person will take their mask off. OK, they keep the distance. That's fine. But other people just start shouting, which actually distorts their voice and doesn't help at all. So it just depends on the circumstances. But, but again, as you know, I am a very good lip reader because I've been lip reading all my life. And it's a very useful skill, but absolutely hopeless for masks. And did you learn to sign at all? No, I didn't. It, it was quite interesting because I'm self-taught. Uh, I was knocked down by a car when I was a child and I apparently I fractured both ears. Now, normally when you fracture your ears, you fracture your skull, but I managed to do one without the other which it resulted in the bones in the inner ear being smashed. Um, but it took the medics five years to accept that I was deaf. So I had tonsils and adenoids and sinus washouts, you name it. I was in and out of hospital. And then when I was eight, it was acknowledged that I was deaf and I was given a hearing aid, which was far too big for my school blouse pocket. So I had to put it on the desk with the wire coming up and I was just given the one at the time and I absolutely hated it. And of course, I was teased and victimised and what have you. So I, I avoided wearing it and I could cope, generally speaking, with lip reading. So, yeah, I mean, it, I just I don't know any different because I was only three. So I've just learned to live with it. But that misdiagnosis or lack of diagnosis that must have led to a lot of frustrations for many parties around you, from parents to also yourself not being understood. Well, I didn't know what was wrong. I mean, I knew that um, I wasn't good enough for the school choir because I was told I'd, I wasn't singing in tune. As far as I was concerned, I was hearing a different tune to everybody else. And when I was, um, must have been about five, I was chosen to be an attendant to the May Queen. And that meant I could dance around the Maypole. And I was really excited about this. And then suddenly I was told I couldn't do it anymore. And the reason was that someone would come to the classroom door and call for the dancers to go and rehearse. And of course, I never heard them. So, but I, I knew that I was different, but I didn't know why until I was eight. But the real clangor, I suppose, came when I was 11, when I was a borderline for the 11 plus. And I had to have an interview to decide whether I was good enough to go to grammar school. And there was a panel of three and there was a lady in the middle wearing a hat. I can see that hat now. And she told me quite categorically that I couldn't possibly cope with grammar school education because I was deaf. So the seed was sown that I was deaf and daft, and I believed that for many, many years. And it's amazing how those early messages with all of us sink in 
and we actually believe them. So how does that apply to you now? Because you know you're not deaf and daft now. I'm a bit daft, but not in that sense. <laughs> well, as with everything, when we have beliefs, they hopefully are supported by evidence. And the example I give to my clients is that if anyone had said to me 30 years ago, or even 20 years ago, that I'd be able to put a phone in my pocket, I wouldn't have believed them. But now I've got the evidence, I've had to change my belief. And for me, the evidence was negative. I only got two GCSEs when I took my O-levels out of nine, and I had to work very hard to do retakes and get an A-level. And teacher's training was all on, on assessment and assignments, and that was fine. Because when you're in a classroom, you can ask the kids or be quite clear to them that I would only speak to them if they put their hand up so I could work out who was speaking. Um, but my evidence was when I got my master's. That was when the penny dropped. And I suddenly thought, hang on a minute. Yes, I am deaf. And yeah, I'm a bit daft, but not as daft as I thought I was. But it was interesting because when I did a diploma in counselling, which was in the very early 80s, I had to have counselling myself. And that was my turning point or my tipping point, if you like, because until then I had struggled, possibly without realising how much. But the counsellor was amazing. Now, I'm not normally a name dropper, but I am going to drop a name. And this guy was called Christopher Spence. And he went on to become the first director of the London Lighthouse, which was the first HIV and AIDS residential centre in London. And he got an OBE for that. And then he went on to become the CEO of Volunteer England, which is now the National Council for Voluntary Service. And he got um, an MBE for that or the other way around, I can't remember. But he was a pretty astute guy and he saw right through me. And he took me back through all the incidents of my childhood and my experiences and my self-belief and all the rest of it. And at the end of it, I could wear my hearing aids. Now, of course, you can't see them. They're behind the ear. And my my world just opened up. And my career, you know, I, I, I accelerated my career from being a full-time youth worker to team leader to an officer, where which was in the mid 80s and I was in a loony left authority and I had responsibility for young people with disabilities, which was great because I was able to set up um, youth provision for not just physical disabilities, but those with learning difficulties. And we had a club for those with hearing difficulties. And at that time, going back to one of your questions about signing, I did learn Makaton, but as with any language, if you don't use it, you lose it. So it's not something I've practiced over the years. But yeah, I mean, it, in the end, it didn't hold me back. I became, well, I was the chair of the Centre for Youth Work Studies at Brunel University, and they actually awarded me an honorary fellowship for the work I did there, which was nice. I was um, an associate Ofsted inspector, so I go all over the country doing Ofsteds. And so, yeah, my career was in a pretty good place until I lost my dad and then it changed. But I'm a great believer in things happening for a reason. And I really love what I do, helping people change and allowing them to find themselves and get rid of their own negative beliefs. And of course, I share my experience because it does help people to understand that we can change. So what do you think that reason was? Oh, this is the why, isn't it? Well, I, I think possibly you know, I could have stayed on in local authority if, if circumstances had allowed it, but I probably would have got bored. And working, I'd stopped working with young people. I'd stopped doing face-to-face -face work because management is very different. Being part of a senior education team and looking at strategy and policy and budgets, that wasn't really me. So being back working with people, speaking, doing workshops and one-to-ones is great. Suits me down to the ground. 
So you went into lockdown as a want-to-be author and came out as a, a multiple published author. <laughs> well, no, I, I had done one book in 2019, which was, they're all called Stress and Stuff. And the first one was Stress and Stuff Tackling Teenage Mental Health. But it was for adults who live or work with young people. Because let's face it, we all forget what it's like being a teenager. And so it was to remind adults what it felt like being a teenager and then to give them the tools and strategies to help the young people. And then the second one was called Tackling Tough Times. And for that one, I invited other professional speaking association members to share their stories. Because as you know, when you listen to people speaking, it's great, but you don't always absorb the story. But when you can actually see it and read it, we absorb it more efficiently and more effectively. And the, the impact tends to be greater. So yes, I've got about 10, 10 stories from people with a wide range of issues, traumas that they've overcome, how they've survived and thrived, as well as case studies from my own clients. And again, showing people how they can overcome their own issues with the techniques that I use. And let's just go back to that teenage stress. And you said, you know, it's difficult to remember what it was like to be a teenager. Why particularly that niche of, of, of age group do you specialise in? Well, that was the area I had the most uh, experience of. Uh, and I empathise with teenagers. And of course, I'm a recycled teenager myself. So <laughs> no, I, I just think it's, it's a very um, challenging period in your life moving from childhood through to adulthood and there's no guidebook to help you and it's a time of, of change a time of challenge a time of emotional pain and sorting out your values and your beliefs and often we we actually skip that out because we're not taught in school how to look at our beliefs and our value systems or indeed how our minds work which I find very frustrating because it would be much more useful to all of us than X plus Y equals whatever. I skip that bit so I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, nor do I. <laughs> no, but from, on a serious matter, you're right, there is no guidebook and there is no way to navigate through the, the challenges and changes. And with the values and the beliefs, I think that's a really important one as well to to sort of dwell on that exercise of understanding your values and serving them, not just sort of understanding them, but then how do you actually meet those in your everyday life and in your work? What difference has that made for you? Well, I think we all live by our attitudes, beliefs and values. They are our framework as well as our perceptions of others. And I always say to clients, especially young people, to really explore their values because they affect their relationships. So two things here. One is that a lot of young people challenge their values, or sorry, challenge their parents' values that they inherit or they've received, like mum and dad want them in by 11 o'clock and they want to stay out to one o'clock. Um, but they either accept them or reject them. But when they actually start to look at their relationships, they will find, as we all do, the people we are most comfortable with and we feel safest with are those who have similar values to ours. And those who we just don't connect with are those who have totally different values to ours. And once they realize that, be it boyfriend, girlfriend, relationship or just uh, same gender relationships the penny drops and oh that's why I don't get on with so and so oh that's why that didn't work and just being aware of that is an enormous insight into how to conduct relationships and what to look for and understand why things don't work out so let's just go back to how you introduced yourself and you said you're a stress consultant for all ages from four to eighty four 
Now, there must be different ways that you approach those different age groups. But you mentioned that you're doing a lot of hypnosis, a lot of EFT, the emotional freedom tapping or, or therapy. That is incredible. And I, I've been introduced to that more recently. And I had no idea how powerful and effective that can be. Why don't you just talk us through through some of your techniques that you use? Well, first of all, if you were sitting in my chair, I would give you a cup of tea and then I would listen to you tell your story, what's wrong, what the issues are. And then I would explain how your mind works, which, as most of us know, it's in two parts, the conscious and the subconscious. The conscious is only 5% of your mind power. 95% is the subconscious. So I describe it like a filing cabinet because everything you've learned all your experiences, all your memories, all your emotions, all your automatic body functions, your habits, your fears, all those things are stored in that filing cabinet. So let me just ask you to illustrate this. What are six sixes? 36. Now, you obviously learned your tables and you'd be amazed at the number of people who haven't. But just by asking you what six sixes are, which wasn't on your mind at all, Draw in the filing cabinet opens and gives you the answer. So six sixes acts as a trigger. Now, the same thing happens with habits, with fears, our experiences. So if, for example, you've had a crunch in your car, whenever you pass either a similar car or where it happened, that memory will come flooding back because it acts as a trigger. So it's helping people to understand what their triggers are and where things start. Now, I talk about the subconscious as being a monkey on your shoulder. And I actually have, I've got about 12 monkeys. People keep giving them to me, all shapes and sizes. And I sit with a little monkey on my shoulder to demonstrate how that can act as that inner voice, that inner critic, whatever we want to call it. I'm no good, I'm useless, I'm not good enough, all the things, the doubts and things that we all go through at some time in our life. And however much the conscious mind says, don't be silly, you're all right, you're fine, you'll be all right, it doesn't make any difference. The subconscious is going to win because that's the powerhouse. So with children, young children, I talk about the monkey mind. I sit there with, they sit with one, one of the larger monkeys. They can cuddle on the chair. And then in terms of explaining how to get rid of the nasties, I will talk to them about the magic in their fingertips and how there's buttons on them which they can tap, which then releases the negative feelings. And I also have a series of audios for little children called Merlin the Magic Monkey. And Merlin the Magic Monkey deals with all sorts of bugs. So we've, I've got sleepy bugs, yucky bugs, which is sickness, bitey bugs, scaredy bugs. Uh, I can't remember the others, but they're all about the child going to the magic forest and in light hypnosis, Merlin, the magic monkey, extracts the issues and like the magic, they come out of the, the words come out of the child's mouth and go into a magic box. And I've had a lot of good feedback from that. One little girl called me her fairy godmother, which is rather sweet. <laughs> but with older children and obviously young people and adults, I just explain how EFT works and hypnosis and of course they both work on the subconscious see when I did my master's in counseling psychology counseling was the the very trendy thing to do you go and see a counsellor but no disrespect to any counsellors out there but it takes too long and a lot of especially young people they have great long waiting lists for CAMs children and adult med mental health services, one or two sessions with EFT and hypnosis, and they're in a much better place. And they don't have to wait that length of time. And they don't have to relive it by talking about it again and again and again. But once people know how to do EFT, it is a skill for life. And that's what I say to people, whenever you feel out of sorts or there's something bothering you, 
sit down, have a cup of tea, tea and tapping, and sort it out. Ask yourself, what am I feeling? If it's negative, tap it out. And it's it's just so powerful, as you you know. Yeah, and I love the, the the couple of phrases that you've just used there, which is one, which is to have the magic in your fingertips. To, and also the other one, which is when you learn it, you have the skill for life. So what I'm hearing from both of those is that you are giving people self-help techniques so that they're not reliant on others, that they're able to help themselves. Oh, very much so. I mean, I'm actually doing myself out of business, but I, I do believe in empowerment. And I do believe that, that, that that's so important. Nobody wants to be dependent on somebody else. And if you wake up distressed in the middle of the night, there's nobody there. But if you know you can tap or you can put a, one of my audios on to help release stuff, whatever it is, then you have a means of dealing with it. I also do EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. It's the right mouthful. But but again, it's a self-help technique that people can use anytime, anywhere, for anything, at any age. So it's, they're, yes, they are self-help techniques, a DIY SOS, do it yourself, save our sanity. So what's the need that people have to be dependent or, or to be independent and not dependent on others? What does that mean for you? Well, people are generally uncomfortable about asking for help. I think that be it's a human trait, isn't it? We want to be able to cope. And it's when we can't cope, we don't feel we're in control of our lives, that we need help. But as I say, asking for it is, is challenging. So if you have a skill where that you can utilise yourself and not have to ask for help, then, well, as I said earlier, it puts you in control. It gives you a coping strategy. And it's just so much nicer to be able to do it yourself. And now knowing, Ruth, that all those years of where it, it does seem that it was very stressful, where you, you, you had to work out that you couldn't balance all of what you were doing, that something had to go, and that was for you to take early retirement, would you say that that was one of the best things that actually happened to you? Oh, definitely. Definitely, because now I have a nice work-life balance. Um, my husband's retired, so we can go on holiday when we want and I can work around that. And, of course, with writing as well, I can do that in my own time and I enjoy doing it. Um, I'm doing a couple of children's books at the moment, again, which is, is great because um, I just find it so satisfying. And because there's a message that will actually help people, then it feels worth, more worthwhile that I'm investing in people as well as leaving a legacy. So I'm a, a great fan. Um, I'm actually, a, well, I was, a master facilitator for the Seven Habits team program. So I'm a great fan of the Seven Habits. And one of the lovely videos is live, love, laugh and leave a legacy. And I think that's such a lovely saying. So what is the legacy that you'll be leaving? My books, my audios, um, two sons who have done very well for themselves in their lives, um, a nice home. You know, I, th I think I've worked hard and I've played hard. My husband has been very frustrated during lockdown because his ambition during retirement was to have eight holidays a year. So I had to juggle things around his planning, but he's back doing it again now. <laughs> now that we're, where the light is at the end of the tunnel, he's busy planning things. But the biggest excitement for me at the moment is that my son in Canada is defying everything and quarantine included. He's going to come over in the summer so I can actually meet my grandson for the first time, which would be lovely. Uh, it'll be amazing. Yeah, what, what, there's been quite a few lockdown babies of people who have just haven't had that opportunity to see their family members. And you know, there haven't been any new babies in my family, the not that I know of. But in terms of I have missed, you know, seeing my mom, my dad, my grandma, my brother. So, yeah, I'd be really looking forward to to heading over and seeing them. 
So what's on the agenda? What's next for you? Where are you taking your your why and what is it you're going to be implementing next? Oh, I've got so many balls in the air. It's waiting for one to drop or for me to decide which one to catch. Um, I got involved through um, a networking group with um, a fabulous woman who helps do books. Um, When I say books, I don't just mean the sort of books that I write, but journals and notebooks and gratitude journals and all that sort of thing. And um, I'm getting addicted and she's she's um, a very generous soul and gives a lot of time and she will go through things because one of the challenges with writing a book, it's not the content, it's the layout, it's the formatting, it's getting the pages right and the page breaks and, and all the things that I've learned myself through trial and error, but not by doing it correctly. And she's putting me straight and helping me do things correctly, which is great. So it won't cost me quite so much to get things formatted. Um, I'm looking to get the children's books. I've got two that I'm doing um, illustrated. And then I also want to do some online courses so that my message can go out to many rather than to just one or two, which is um, something which goes back to teaching days, I suppose, one to many is always more effective. And obviously with speaking, doing workshops, whatever I can to get the message out there that you don't have to suffer. And far too many people are suffering with their emotional health and they don't need to. If you can find out what the root cause is, I mean, I joke with clients and say that Midsummer Murders has got nothing on me because I keep digging and I have a set of Russian dolls in my room because everything starts somewhere and tracking back to find out when things actually started is very illuminating for clients and for people and I can track back quite quickly quite easily to the impact that that car accident had on my life and it's defined me which is fine because it doesn't now impede me. It doesn't stop me doing anything other than hearing people who've got masks on. (laughs) And I love that sort of metaphor that you have with the Russian dolls. A lot of people use a metaphor of the onions and peeling the the layers of the onion or or talking about it in the five whys. They just keep going and asking, why is that? Why is that? And I love the Russian doll because, you you know, you have all this facades and yet, you know, what is it that's actually there is that tiny little piece inside that, you know, once you know what that means, uh, then it will make it a lot of lot more sense to you. So with stress, I mean, you focus on stress and stuff, you know, stress and stress works and tackling tough times. The focus is on stress. Yet, that's not what we want to focus on, really. No, of course not. It's eliminating stress. And it's about feeling in control. It's changing your mind, changing your life, changing how you feel, how you think, how you behave by eliminating the stress in your life. Now, that stress could be negative memories, painful memories. It could be negative feelings. It could be negative beliefs. But yes, it's about eliminating the negativity. And and again, with EFT and hypnosis and EMDR, it's, it's easy. It's effective and it's quick and it's painless and it's powerful. And I use it. I say no pills, no pain. Because once people know how to do it, they don't need antidepressants or anything like that to actually eliminate, no, not eliminate, to blanket how they feel. Because they don't do any good. It's like having a bottle of wine. The problem's still there in the morning. Yeah, and a headache as well. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, so with that, you, you talk about eliminating negativity. Is there ever a time when stress is actually good for us? Yes, it's called U-stress, E-U-stress. And the example I like to give for that is a child waking up on Christmas morning. 
when everything's exciting and the world is a wonderful place. But of course, you stress is the good stuff that gets us up in the morning. We have a purpose for the day and, and we get up and it gives us that energy. But unfortunately, the way our minds seem to be programmed, the negativity can squash that very quickly. So that's why it's so important. But very few people understand the difference between pressure and stress. Now, you could argue it's on a continuum. And I use, I'm a great one for analogies, the analogy of a glass of water. If you fill a glass of water to the top, it's going to overflow. So the only way you can put anything else in that glass is by emptying the glass. Now, obviously, when it's overflowing, that's the stress. But the pressure builds up over time and can tip into stress. But if you deal with pressure on an everyday basis, it goes away. So people say, oh, I got really stressed because I was in a traffic jam. But when they came out of the traffic jam, the pressure went away. So it's understanding the difference. So in a nutshell, pressure goes away. Stress doesn't. It builds and builds and builds, and then it manifests itself in physical illness. And what the mind suppresses, the body expresses. And most people hold stress in their bodies. So they might have neck ache, shoulder ache, tense chest, kids get stomach ache, whatever it is, we hold it in our bodies. And again, it can be released with tapping. People say, oh, I've got a backache. So we do a couple of rounds of tapping and they say, oh, that saved me a fortune on a massage because they've actually relaxed their muscles. But of course, it all starts up here in the head, in the mind. And I get very um, cross. I was putting it mildly, actually. When the NHS was established in 1948, they sadly only focused on physical health, not holistic health or mental health. And now especially, I think we're seeing the problems that that possibly brought about. Um, and I just think it's so sad that people don't realise that they can do something about it. So with that, that it was, there was a huge focus on physical health and not on mental health. Yeah, yes, there has been a huge stigma historically that we've we've grown up with where it's not said or not done to talk about it. You keep it hidden. It, and lots of ways that, of, of manifestation of, of stress, headaches, of migraines, of, of people taking time off work they were always I've got a backache or I've got you know problems here but they were our manifestations of actual other symptoms so but now it's becoming more acceptable and it there's a lot of focus on mental health and it's okay to show that side of vulnerability do you think that's going to be the end of it no <laughs> is the simple answer. No, be, because we all have curveballs thrown at us in life. And it's um, we never know what's around the corner. And we don't know what life is going to throw at us. But it's if you have the skills to deal with it, then it doesn't have to be traumatic or an enormous curveball. It's just something, OK, I need to deal with this. You deal with it and then you move on. But if you're blocked, you can't move on. So again, it comes back to having the skills and the know-how to actually deal with things. But no, of course, it's not going to go away any more than physical health isn't going to go away. You know, I like the term emotional health rather than mental health because it doesn't have quite the same stigma. But of course, mental health is a good thing. Physical health is a good thing. So I never really understand why we say about mental health being something derogatory and a stigma. But in Canada, and I was there visiting my son a couple of years ago, they have posters all over the place saying mental health is health. And, and I thought that was nice. And I agree with that, because if you are mentally healthy or emotionally healthy, then your body is far more likely to be healthy. A calm mind is a calm body. That's not to say you, 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 got, you aren't going to break a leg or an arm or something like that. But that's, that's very different from what we're talking about. 
No, I, I completely understand, Ruth, and it, it's such a, a great distinction to make. And I, I love that phrasing of emotional health. It, it, it's really interesting how over the years, or, or even centuries or even millennia, the more we understand about ourselves still doesn't stop that cycle of growth early years through teenage, through adulthood to where you are. That, that is replicated every single generation. You see the same process of people going through it because there doesn't seem to be a way of, of learning or helping and of changing earlier that has been instilled those early formative years where if you if you'd have been diagnosed and you'd been helped then you wouldn't have had those limiting beliefs from an early age and you see that pattern continue even though we have more information at our fingertips why do you see that why do you think that is constantly the sort of pattern that we go through in life because life changes i mean if you think to certainly my parents generation they lived through the war and their experiences are very different from mine. And my son's experiences with social media are totally different from mine. You know, and each generation, yes, we have, I mean, I grew up in the 60s. So I guess I had the benefit of, of that, you know, not necessarily in the context of free love and what have you, but life was much freer and with great music and things like that and nothing major in terms of pressures which the young people are experiencing now I mean I said before about having a few bulls in the air but my goodness young people today that they must have about 20 bulls in the air at once trying to deal with things and it's 24 7 information overload and I certainly didn't have to cope with that and I doubt that you did either and I, I think it's um, life is changing all the time and therefore it's hard to relate to the different generations and how they're experiencing things. And although we can learn from the different generations, we still want to do things for ourselves, don't we? And find out for ourselves. Absolutely. And, and I don't recall the exact sort of statistic, but in, in essence, it would make sense that we are exposed to more information in one day than people in the 16th century would have been in their lifetimes. And I know that that's probably not quite what it was or, or where I referenced for that from. But the general gist is, is that is supporting what you're saying is that it's changing all the time. We're evolving. We've got very different ways of living. And what we perceive now as being stressful may not be considered that in 10, 15, 20 years. I, I don't know who's to say I'm not, not a futurist and I'm certainly not Merlin. I wish I was Merlin the monkey. <laughs> I would be able to help there. Well, hopefully, you know, as you say, in 10 or 20 years time, COVID will be a distant memory. I mean, my mum, bless her, had polio as a child. And very few people know what polio is these days because it has, generally speaking, been eradicated. And when I was a kid, she was um, a medical secretary and there was a specialist, polio specialist there. And we used to walk kids to our house who were in iron lungs. We'd push the trolley with the iron lung. My dad would take the front door off and we'd push the trolley in so this kid could watch television. And bearing in mind, I'm talking black and white television on a Sunday afternoon. And then we would push the kid back and put the front door back on. <laughs> uh, but now, of course, polio is just something that, as I say, people just don't know about. So hopefully COVID will be one of those stressful memories that we'll be able to put behind us. Absolutely. And, and with that, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on, Ruth. It's been a pleasure exploring the world of stress or, or, or less stress, reduced stress but with you. It's been an absolute pleasure. How would people get hold of you? How would they buy the books that you've written? They're all on Amazon. So if you were to put in stress and it's N, stress, N apostrophe stuff, uh, by Ruth Falk, they will come up. And in terms of getting hold of me, my website is www.stressworks.co.uk. 
And my email is ruth at stressworks.co.uk. My Facebook page is Stressworks. And it's W-O-R-X, not works. People say stress doesn't work, but it's not in that context at all. Um, otherwise, um, I'm on LinkedIn as Ruth Fogg. I'm on Instagram as Ruth Fogg Stressworks. So there's plenty of options there. Perfect. Well, they'll all go in the show notes, so it doesn't matter how they type it in because they can just click on the link. So we're all good there. But thank you so much, Ruth. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Do you have some final words for the audience, please? Well, one of my strap line is that I offer positive solutions for peace of mind, which is what we were talking about as opposed to stress. And when I uh, do networking, I always write a little ditty and I end with, don't struggle and get depressed. Let stress works, put your mind at rest. Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star Apple podcast review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook, and become a member of my inspiring, uplifting, and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. I help people to focus on their why with clarity, uniting their passion with their purpose with a plan to create the life they truly desire. If you would like me to help you focus on your why, then please book a free 20-minute coaching call via calendly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Friday Focus weekly newsletter via my website, amyrowlandson.com. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Why?